I want to say welcome. And the first thing I want to do is thank Kim Rudder, who is our consultant emeritus. Come, she came out of retirement to help us organize this in-service, and I am internally grateful for her and all the hard work that she has done. So thank you, Kim. And since March 2020, it, it's been a rough road. And, and what we wanted to do, you know, in response to all of this coping and pivoting and adjusting to a new reality that we've had to do is create a bit of a retreat for the fall in service. Unfortunately, COVID uh, had other plans for that as well, but we still have tried to put together a slate of programs and presentations that will help us uh, get through this and flex our resiliency, which we all are. I want to introduce everybody to our new consultant. So Amy Ivan is joining us today. This is actually her first day. So I want to say uh, welcome, Amy. Amy comes to us. Uh, she was the director of library services at Reach University and helped build that library from scratch. And before that, she was the adult programming librarian at the Olathe Public Library. And she comes to us with lots of experience and a fine arts degree, so artsy fartsy background, which I really appreciate. Uh, and we look forward to introducing her to everybody. And Kim has already volunteered to help us with all those introductions, so that'll be fun. I just wanted to introduce Amy. I am going to do an introduction for our keynote speaker. And then I will uh, hand it over to her. So April Roy is our keynote today. April's the Director of Employee Success at the Kansas City Public Library. During her career of over 20 years, she's served as a children's librarian, a branch manager, and programming director. April became interested in trauma-informed library services during her time as the manager of the L.H. Bluford uh, Library that's in Kansas City's historic east side. Her work there was honored with the 2015 I Love My Librarian Award. Congratulations. During the pandemic, her work tur turned towards self-compassion and empathy building. April never turns down a chance to use the microphone to advocate for libraries and librarians. When she's not working, she enjoys road trips, picture books, and spending time with her theatrical daughter and her three lovely cats. So April, I would like to hand this over to you now and thank you so much for your willingness to share your thoughts and insights with my staff and with all of us here at SEK. Thank you all so much for having me today. Um, that was such a nice introduction. Thank you, Sharon. I'm going to uh, share my screen here and uh, we'll get I will mention that April is um, a co-member of the Notable Books Committee with me. So it's great that we get to see each other in this capacity as well. Yes, that notable books thing is something else, Tammy. Um, it's been really amazing, y'all. I come home every day to boxes and boxes full of children's books. So it's really a joy to get to do um, what I do. So I'm not here to talk about picture books today. Although if you guys ever wanted me to talk about picture books, just give me a call. It's my favorite thing to talk about. Um, I'd be happy to do that. But really today, um, I'm here to... Let's see if I can get my slides to go back and forth. Hey, hey. So here's what we're here for today, um, to talk about the things that are going on, um, to talk about how to take care of yourself, your staff, your coworkers, how to be a good teammate um, during this COVID-19 pandemic that we've all been going through. So I made this presentation at the start of the pandemic, and I have been slowly changing it as I've been asked to repeat it because the pandemic just keeps going, right? You guys, we're, we're 19 months into this, right? Um, it's not stopping. It's still going. We're still worrying. We're still um, in the midst of this traumatic collective trauma sort of event. Um, and it's important to acknowledge that and to talk about it. So I really appreciate um, the Southeast Kansas library system for inviting me, um, for caring enough about your librarians to, 
talk about a topic like this. Um, we could gloss over it and move on, um, but I don't think that would do anyone any good. So I'm happy we're talking about it. But really, I want to know first, um, how are you guys doing? Like, how would you say you feel today? Are you tired? My um, 12 year old this morning, when I asked her how she was, she said she felt like hot garbage. I was just like, oh, okay. <laughs> I'm not sure that's a great way to start a Friday Eve, but um, please feel free to type in the chat. I want this to be very interactive. I really want to know um, what kind of space are you guys in right now? How are you doing? Um, I can tell you in Kansas City, uh, things are kind of tense. We aren't sure how we're doing. Things are changing all the time. Um, I can tell you I personally this morning feel really happy to be here, but I also feel kind of tired, kind of worried about, you know, things going on. Um, so feel free to type in the chat. Let me know. Let me know how you feel and how you're doing. What's going on? Are you guys out there? Are you awake? Are you polling each other before you type anything in the chat? There we go. I love it. Sharon is nervous. I was a little nervous this morning too. I really hope you guys get a lot of good information out of what I'm about to share. Um, apprehensive, anxious, anxiety is huge these days. Um, I talk to a lot of people that have never really experienced anxiety at this level. You know, they always thought, you know, I used to get a little nervous or worried about things here and there, but never anxiety to the level that I feel it now. Um, anxiety is also something new for me, something that I've actually had to talk to a doctor about because never before have I had to deal with this much anxiety. Weary, tired, overwhelmed, awake. I'm jealous of all you people with coffee. <laughs> Should have got some coffee this morning, but I didn't quite have time. Tired, missing in-person meetings. I'm sure you guys would all love to be together right now, talking face-to-face, -face, hugging each other. How many of you guys miss hugs? Um, health concerns, stressed, exhausted, tired, overwhelmed, worried, weary. Um, I appreciate you all sharing so much, um, letting us in. Oh, I have another hugger. I'm a hugger too. Battle weary. That's an amazing way to describe um, our collective feelings right now. High cases, but the community is acting like nothing's happening. We have a lot of that happening in Kansas City too overwhelmed, rushed. Um, you guys, I have you all type this in the chat just so we all simply know we're not alone. Um, we're all in this together. Oh, wow. I'm so glad you didn't have a car accident. That would have been terrible. I'm glad you were scheduled for this call. I'm not sure that giving them a piece of your mind would have done any good and might've put you in danger. So I'm really happy you're here and safe behind on everything, can't catch up. Hey, how many of you guys feel kind of like your confidence has been sort of shot? <laughs> I feel like the, the pandemic sort of stole my confidence, right? Um, behind on everything and can't catch up. The feelings of I'm not good enough. I've forgotten how to do what I do. My job has changed so much. It's all brand new. Um, what's going on here? Ah, you know, we're all kind of feeling that way. So I really appreciate you all sharing. I want you guys to know that you are all good enough. And by the end of this presentation, you should know that. Um, I'm gonna say things in this presentation. I'm gonna repeat some things in this presentation. Um, and the things that I repeat or say more than once are things that I think are really important. It's not just because I, I forgot where I was and I'm saying things twice. Um, Yes, Wendy's saying we should all feel wonderful that we lived through it. We are all collectively survivors of trauma. Um, and there are ways to deal with that and ways to help make that better. There are ways to be a better team member, ways to be a better manager or supervisor, board member. I saw that we have all kinds of people on this call um, from trustees, managers, supervisors, staff members. Uh, and that's amazing. I hope every one of you gets something out of this. So let's go on and talk about, I'm having some trouble making my slides switch. Here we go. Frustrated, frustrated is a good one too. So today we are going to learn about um, 
ways to show that we care. We're going to talk about creating positive environments. We're going to discuss self-care and we're going to learn how taking care of ourselves is the most important thing. You can't take care of everyone else if you aren't taking care of yourself, right? And how many of you guys have heard that before? <laughs> how many of you guys can say to yourselves, wow, I'd really love to take care of myself, but I don't have time for all that. I put everybody first. Um, good luck. Good luck with that, April, right? Um, we're going to talk through some of those things too. So you guys, I said I would tell you what I think is the most important thing you can possibly do uh, during COVID to take care of yourself and take care of your staff, your teammates, and your coworkers. And I honestly believe that the number one thing that helps in this situation more than anything else is communication. Um, you guys can see just from my PowerPoint slide, it is key, 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 key. Yes, 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 yes. Um, communication is the most important thing to keeping everyone on the same page, um, keeping people from having all the negative feelings without having any positive feelings to go back on. Um, communication really is the most important thing. It's key. Have I mentioned that communication is needed? Communication is important. Let's talk a little bit about what that communication can look like. It's not always easy um, when we're feeling all of these negative feelings, frustration, insecurity, all of these things, it can be hard to communicate in a positive way. And I believe that's um, difficult, but not impossible to overcome, right? Uh, so communication is the key. It's the most important thing, but how should that really look? And it should look all of the ways. Communication should be happening in every direction. If you're at the top, you should be communicating everything that you can down. If you're at the bottom, you should be communicating up. You should be asking questions. You should be asking questions of the people above you, the people below you, the people at your level. If you don't know something, you should be asking. Um, I say all the time, I can't even tell you guys how many times I've said this. I've said at least a thousand times, Things that we don't know about are scary, right? That's basic. If you don't know about something, it's scary. It's dark under your bed. You don't know what's under there. Maybe the monster's hiding under your bed. It's probably not, but you don't know that until you look and you're too scared to look, right? So the things we don't know about are scary. If we know about them, they're less scary. The only way to know about things is to communicate, to either be communicating what you're doing or be communicating what's going on around you or be listening to the communication happening. If there's something broken in the communication, everything's gonna go wrong. Everything's gonna be scary because people aren't gonna know about it. And things we don't know about are scary. Whether it's a library program, whether it's a library initiative, whether it's a security policy, whether it's what the rules are gonna be tomorrow, things we don't know about are scary. So even if we don't know, because sometimes we don't have all the answers, right? We don't know what to communicate. I don't know what to tell you because I don't know the answers either, right? Um, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't know if COVID's going to get better. I don't know if Kansas City is going to have a mask mandate or not have a mask mandate. I don't know all those things. But what I can communicate is that I'm paying attention. I'm paying attention to what's going on around me. I'm on top of it. I'm reading all the news articles. If I'm a decision maker, I'm an informed decision maker. And I might not know what that decision is right now, but I can tell you that I'm on top of it and I'm informed. And I can tell you my process for making those decisions. If I'm a person at the bottom um, of the, the food chain, whatever you wanna call it, um, please know you are just as important as that decision maker. You're the person right there every day um, shelving those books, helping those patrons face to face, you're the one. So if you have things that can make it less scary for those decision makers, communicate that up. Communication for it to work both ways has to work both ways, right? The people at the top have things that they think are scary too. We're scared. We don't know how our staff feel. We're not sure how they're going to react to this. We're not sure even what the problems necessarily they're facing are. I don't know how to give them the right tools that they need because I don't know what's going on. That's scary. Things I don't know about are scary too. So that communication needs to happen both ways. I wanna make sure you all know communication includes listening. 
careful listening, <laughs> not distracted listening. It's really hard not to be distracted right now. I get that. But you have to be actively listening and hearing what's being said too. Um, listening closely and not making your own assumptions before you hear all of the information. Your communication has to be honest. It has to keep it real. If you don't know what's going on, say so. If you do, say so. If it's hard, say so. Not passive aggressively, clearly and honestly. I don't know what's gonna happen. That's honest. It's way better than this might happen and this might happen and get your hopes up for this, but then I didn't really know that for sure. And then that doesn't happen. And then everyone's devastated, right? Be honest, keep it real. Make sure that you're talking, make sure that you're checking in. Checking in is important, y'all. Checking in should be happening. Um, checking in can be casual. Good morning, how are you today? That's great. But checking in should also be scheduled and formal sometimes. If you don't have a regular meeting with the people that you work with, somehow a time for you to check in, to talk, to see how you're doing, to talk about what's going on, to find positive solutions, then you're missing a real opportunity. So I would encourage all of you to make sure you have a scheduled time. If you are a supervisor, schedule 30 minutes to talk with your people that you supervise individually, one-on-one. -on -one. Um, if you are a person that is supervised by someone else, we all are, right? If you don't have a regular scheduled check-in on the calendar with your supervisor, you should ask for one. Tell your supervisor, hey, it would make me feel really comfortable if we just had, you know, 30 minutes on the calendar, a couple, every other week, maybe even once a month, just so we can, you know, make sure that we're having time to, to interface with each other and talk. That's great for everyone. I can tell you as supervisors, um, it's a perfect way to make sure your staff are okay, make sure that you're all achieving the same goals, make sure that you're working towards the same purpose. It's also a great way to document the great things that are going on with your staff. You know, I know I have this 30 minute meeting with my staff member. Um, every time we have that meeting, we talk about the great things that are happening. And I document those because eventually it might be evaluation season and I'm going to have to write all this stuff down and I'm not going to want to have to create that from scratch. But I've been having these great check-ins periodically. We're all on the same page. Nothing is unknown. Things aren't scary. Every question is answered. We're all good, right? So those scheduled check-ins are just as important as those casual greetings every morning. Um, those two things can work together to create a really positive communication, all the directions. So communication, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> all the time, communication should be happening. Communication should be unplanned, but it should also be planned. If you're planning library initiatives, um, there should be a communication plan built into that. You just got a new grant. What's the communication plan? All of these things should have an element of communication plan. We're gonna change a policy. What's the communication plan? Okay, plan it, do it, make sure that it's happening because I can assure you it is the best way to work towards creating an environment that's not scary. Okay. Let's see. So <laughs> it's easy for me to say, right? Um, Communication is the key. It's super easy. Go communicate. Have a good day, y'all. We're done here. No, we're not. We're not done at all because communication sounds easy, but it's actually pretty complicated. It can be pretty complicated, but we're going to Cliff's Notes keep it simple today. Um, you can go to college and get a whole degree in communication. That right there tells you it's not simple, <laughs> right? So um, here are just some tips for keeping it honest and keeping it real. Uh, you need to admit if you don't know something, sometimes you don't. Ask questions of people above you and people under you. Talk, communicate, ask. Listen closely and know what people's touchy points are. And I call them touchy points because um, I couldn't think of a better thing to call them. You know, things that might trigger someone. Um, trigger might be too strong a word, but things that people 
feel strongly about or are passionate about, right? You can kind of know those about your coworkers. I bet if I asked you what the person that sits next to you's touchy points are, you're going to be able to tell me. I had a boss one time, his touchy points was clutter. He hated clutter. So, you know, if I was talking to him, I would try to not mention the clutter because I would know if I mentioned the clutter, I was going to get a 30 minute clutter lecture and not really achieve what I wanted to talk about. Um, we've had some folks during COVID that masking is their touching point. Vaccines can be a touching point, a touchy point. You guys, you kind of know this, you feel out your people and you can avoid things that are touchy points unless the touchy points are the topic, right? If the touchy points, the topic, you got to talk about it. You have to talk about it eventually. Hard conversations are hard, but if the touchy point is not the topic, maybe now is not the right time to bring up the touchy point. Does that make sense to everyone? We want to we want to be gentle with people and gentle with people during the communication process, not always talking about things that are their touchy points. So in every situation, find something to be grateful for and say it. Um, start your conversation, start your check-ins with the great things that have happened. Um, this is going really well. I'm really happy for this. You're doing really great work in all of these ways. Um, talk about the positives first. I always love talking about the positives first. I've even heard people talk about the positive bookends, that you start positive, you do the difficult in the middle, and then you end with a positive. Um, so it can be, you're doing really great work, you know, what's going on I can help with. We talk about the thing that needs helped with. We find a great positive solution. You end that conversation with a thank you. Thank you so much for making me aware of this. Thank you so much for taking the time to work through this with me. Um, I think we're really going to be able to move forward in a positive direction. So you start on that great note, you end on that great note, and then people leave feeling good. Now, this is definitely a best case scenario. I understand that this can't always happen, but it should be the goal every time. Um, avoid setting high expectations, be realistic. I think right now um, we have hiring problems, right? You can't find people to work. We're having it in Kansas City. We're having trouble finding great qualified staff. Um, we're short staffed. We're, you know, myriad of problems that could possibly be going on. Um, we're also dealing with this pandemic, the collective trauma of it. We're tired, we're exhausted, we're all functioning in survival mode right now. Our capacities might be limited. We might not be able to accomplish as much as we have in the past. That's okay, that should be acknowledged. Um, and we shouldn't be asking for more than is realistic. When you set a goal, make it a smart goal that's realistic and measurable. Um, in doing that, to avoid setting high expectations, you have to advocate for your staff. You have to advocate for yourself. You have to be able to say, I don't have the capacity for that right now. That one was hard for me. I can give you guys a, per a very personal example. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, I, April Roy, who has been a workaholic since I was 16 years old, never not worked full time since I was 16 years old, um, had a sixth grader that had 100% at home school the entire school year. And I'm a single parent. I didn't have any other options uh, for my daughter. So I took part-time leave. I worked part-time and oversaw sixth grade. This was difficult for me, you guys, to let go of my work. That was where I placed my self-worth um, was terrible for me but I had to advocate for myself and I had to say, I don't have the capacity to be a full-time library and program director and also be a full-time teacher and stay at home parent. I can't do all those things. I had to admit that. And then I had to advocate for myself to find a way to make it work, um, which we did solution focused, always be solution focused, always be thinking about, okay, that's a problem. I acknowledge that. Now we're going to work towards a solution. We're not just going to sit around and complain about the problem. We can talk in ways about the problem that are helpful. We can talk in ways about the problem that are honest. Um, but we also need to talk about the problem in a way that is solution focused. And some problems, y'all, 
don't have solutions. Some problems are problems. Um, and that's when you start talking about tools and other ways to help with the problem. Um, but you do have to be honest. Not everything can be solved with a positive solution. Some, some things are just hard. And we talk about those and we're honest about those, but we don't talk about them in a way that's just complaining. The problem's there. We've acknowledged that. Now we move on. We accept it as something we need to find tools for, something we can solve, or something that just is. Um, I say it is what it is. It is what it is right now. Maybe in the future, it won't be that way. That can be really hard. One other thing I wanna talk about with communication is I statement language. So I think that the best way to communicate that doesn't make other people feel defensive is by using I statement language. I statement language doesn't make you blamey. Um, it doesn't automatically put people on the defensive. Instead, it opens a door towards finding more positive solutions. This can work with library customers. This can work with your library teammates. It can work with your kids, this can work with your partners, this can work with your family, <laughs> um, all of the situations, but this does take practice. There's so much information on the internet. If you guys really wanna start practicing I statement language, you can like think of 25 I statements um, that you would say to other people or things you wanna say to other people and how you would reframe them as I statements. So I have here, like, um, this is an example that happens all the time at the library. You know, people are creating noise. They're creating a disturbance in the library. They're being too loud is what's happening. So you walk up to that patron, you say, you're being too noisy. And they look at you and they say, no, I'm not. Okay, well, you are. Um, you can argue with me if you want to, but you are, you know, they're defensive. They're automatically defensive because you're saying you have done something wrong. No, I haven't. I never do anything wrong. I'm perfect, practically perfect in every way. April Roy right here. I didn't do anything wrong. I'm not being too noisy. That's a judgment call. And I don't agree with your judgment. Because, you know, we have patrons like that, don't we? We do. I know we do. So instead of going over there and automatically putting them on the defensive, you say, I heard a loud noise over here and was concerned. Is everything okay? And then you get, oh, well, I was making this loud noise because of this or whatever, or, oh, wow, I didn't realize I was being loud. It can change the whole tone of a conversation. It might not, y'all, we, we work in the public and I'll keep it real with you. Sometimes it won't, but it's a good start. Um, so you have a cohort, I was a children's librarian. Children's librarians have so much junk, right? All you children's librarians out there, I see you with all your stuff. You need that stuff, I get it. You gotta do crafts and story time and, to go kids and all the things you do. But really your junk is driving me nuts. Your junk's everywhere. The whole workroom is full of kid junk. I get it. Um, that would automatically, when I was a children's librarian and my clutter boss would complain to me, I would go on the defensive. I need all this stuff. This stuff's important. This stuff's helping me do my job. What really is the problem here? Has my junk overflown my cubicle? That could be a problem that we could deal with, but my junk shouldn't be your problem. Back off. That's what I would say. That's how I felt. But if he said to me, April, we need this space right here for this other thing. I need some space for my projects too. I have trouble working in cluttered spaces. That would automatically put me on the empathetic. Oh, wow. I hear you. I can clear this small space here. I can clear my junk from this space so you can do your work too. That takes it off me and my junk and puts it in, oh, I'm a service-minded person. I wanna help you, that's what we do, right? So you say what you need instead of putting something on someone else. Oh, here's the general, you guys. The patrons are way too much today. These people are driving me crazy. I'm done, like I've had it. It's too much, today is too much. How many of you guys have felt that way? I have, you know, you have staff that come back, blah, 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 it's driving me nuts today. Well, what's really going on? What's really happening here? I'm feeling overwhelmed because of all that's going on in the world. It's probably not the patrons. The patrons are probably the same as the patrons have been every day, right? Patrons aren't easy any day. 
but me feeling overwhelmed is, and once I admit that it's me feeling overwhelmed and not the patron's fault, the patrons are just patroning, but I feel overwhelmed today, then I can start to deal with those feelings. So that's just a few examples. I statement language is something that has really, really helped me um, in my personal relationships and definitely in my work relationships. Patrons get a patron. We have to figure out how we feel so we can fix ourselves to help the patrons. Patrons aren't broken. We're not broken either, you guys. I didn't mean that. We're not broken. We're just a little deemed and that's okay. All right, so let's move on and talk some about creating positive work environments. This is something that's so important, and I will tell you all, you should be cheerleading what you do all the time. Be your own biggest cheerleader. Be proud of the work you're doing. Be proud of even the little things you do and talk about them and cheerlead them. Figure out what your teammates do well and talk about them and cheerlead them for that. Look at your statistical reports and find anything at all that is an awesome, verifiable way to cheerlead for yourself. You're doing awesome work. You know you're doing awesome work. If you don't know you're doing awesome work, I'm telling you right now, if you help somebody today, you're doing awesome work. If you said something positive to someone today, you're doing awesome work. You really are. Be proud of that. And that's what we need to do to create positive environments. Be a cheerleader every day. It can be hard. It's not an easy job, but I know you guys are up to the task. So I want to do a brainstorm. I love brainstorming activities. They make me super happy. So everyone, I would like you all to contribute. Um, you can use the chat or if you want to unmute and shout out, that's okay too. Um, all ideas are good ones. And we're going to clarify any questions after we're done brainstorming, not during. So what I want to brainstorm today, I want to share ideas. I know you guys have all probably done things in your library that have helped create a positive environment, something fun you've done for staff. Um, at Kansas City Public Library, for example, we delivered fruit baskets to all of our branches um, a couple times a month. So we knew they were getting some vitamins and minerals. Um, and people really seem to appreciate the fruit basket. So um, let's brainstorm in chat. And again, if anybody wants to shout out, I'm gonna kind of just shout out as I see things pop up in chat. Let's brainstorm. What have I done at my library to create a more positive environment? It can be things that cost, things that don't cost anything at all. Please just share in the chat. Ooh, baked cookies. Oh, Sonic drinks. That's a great idea. Make and takes. Leanne, do you want to tell us more a little, a little more about make and takes? Oh gosh, Pi Day. Did you actually celebrate Pi Day on Pi Day? staff meetings to talk about what everyone's doing well. That's perfect. Ooh, recognizing a patron of the month and giving them a gift card, pizza lunch, cards and treats for staff members on their birthday, and for board members. That's really nice to include your board in your celebrating. Very nice. These are some really great ideas. Some other ones that I've heard from folks, um, dance parties, which is awesome for staff, making sure we welcome everyone into the library by letting them know how important they are as a patron. I'm gonna have to get one of these pies. Decorate the library early for holidays, that's fun. These are some great ideas offering coffee and hot beverages, scheduled food days, surprise lunches for staff. That's a really good one. Oh, I love the idea of doing it potluck and eating family style. That's really nice. Guess how many candies are in a jar? So I see a lot of you that are doing really nice things for your patrons. That's great. 
4-H volunteers to paint the sidewalk for families to enjoy, donuts, community block parties. Oh, here Leanne's chimed in, craft for kids to do at home. So how about things, food is love, Sharon, I love that. How about things specifically, a lot of you mentioned things you were doing to make the library a welcoming, positive environment for patrons, but how about that same focus given to staff? Do your staff have comfortable work spaces? Do your staff have comfortable break spaces? Are you making sure um, staff have time to step away or resources to step away if they need to? Oh, garden produce available for everyone, donated by the community. That's amazing. That would be delicious. Put out an apple cart. That's awesome too. Love that. So many good ideas. And Morgan, open communication is the key. Snacks and valuing people's opinions. That's awesome. For the solo librarians, any collective ideas out there? I have a couple I can share. Staff lunch days. For you solo librarians, things like this. Every opportunity you have to network or share with other librarians. Um, solo librarians also, we're gonna talk some about self-care. That would be a, a difficult position to be in. I've just moved into a new position at my library when I went from having a team of 30 people that I was in charge of to um, being a team of myself. <laughs> it's been really crazy. So I'm feeling some of that solitude. Some days I love it and some days I don't. Ooh, a gift certificate for Margarita. Sue is alone in Fall River. Well, Sue, bless you being out there alone. That's difficult. Love the time we Zoom to have meetings to keep the solo librarians feeling like they're not alone. Solo librarians, I would encourage you all, um, though it will take some effort to reach out, reach out to your other solo librarians and make sure they're okay. Maybe form a solo librarian network or a solo librarian email chain so that you don't have to feel so alone. Um, and I would also make it a goal to reach out, make it a priority. Who did I reach out to today? Who did I talk to today so that I don't feel so solo and alone? Maybe you guys could start a solo Kansas librarian secret Santa to send yourselves little wonderful um, tchotchkes or things since you don't have other people to do it for you. You guys are great. Any other last minute ideas we wanna share? Here's a great one. Listen to what's exciting and then um, talk in a forum. The work we do is valuable, even if we're solo. I think that's so true. It can be a Facebook group. There are a lot of ways you could do that. I want to encourage the solo librarian support group very much because <laughs> that sounds like a really tough job. I used to say that even being a branch manager, um, was a lonely job in our library system. We have 10 branches. And when you're the manager of that branch, you're you know, not supposed to really be friends, buddies with the people that work for you. And you don't have anyone else there with you at your level. And it can be a really lonely job. So um, being a solo librarian, I could see being a really, a really lonely thing. Yes, let's get a list of the solo librarians and we can all send them emails, cards, and snacks. I would totally be up for um, being part of that solo librarian support system. You guys are awesome. I think Sharon's gonna work on it. She looks really happy about that idea. <laughs> you guys are awesome. Thank you all so much for sharing um, all of your ideas during our brainstorm. That's really great. So let's talk a little bit more about this. So um, we want to change the narrative, right? We've talked about changing our communication style using I statement language, um, using formal and casual check-ins. So let's talk some about how we're going to change the narrative at our libraries. Um, you guys can see here, I've put some, some examples on one side. We're in so much danger that COVID's so scary. 
Um, people are being extra mean right now, you guys. Our country, in addition to the COVID pandemic, is experiencing a mental health crisis. And I don't know how many of you guys are feeling that from some of your library patrons, um, but I know in Kansas City, we're feeling it. We're feeling it pretty big time um, from some of our library patrons. And it's not that people are mean, it's that they're going through some stuff too, but it comes out really ugly sometimes, right? I've been called some crazy names during this pandemic, like weird stuff. Um, we're all gonna lose our jobs. I hate wearing the mask all day. We're all working so hard, blah, you know, all the negative things, right? So we flip that. We flip it to a more positive um, narrative that yeah, we are kind of in danger. The pandemic is super scary. We're seeing all these people. We don't know if they're, we don't know. We don't know, right? Um, but our administration's gotten us PPE. They're keeping up with the latest studies. We're happy to see our regular patrons again. You know, We acknowledge that some of the patrons are going through some stuff and they might seem extra mean, but man, isn't it great to see all those cute kids when they come in? Or isn't it great that we got to see Mr. So-and-so again? I, you know, I really missed him coming in to read the value line every day. Um, those kinds of things. You guys know you have your regular people that make your job great. And our jobs have changed. We acknowledge it. Our jobs have changed, but it's sure great to be here with you. It's great to be here with you all today in the Zoom. It's great to be um, with your people. The unknown is super tricky, but I'll pass on the information as I have it. And we can plan and we can adjust and we're flexible and we can change. If something doesn't work, we can try something else because nobody's gone through this before, right? It's this idea of we're in this together. It's tricky, but we can do it. We can get through it. We'll work together. Um, please tell me what happened. Tell me what happened so we can find ways to make it better. Why do you feel so ah right now? Let's figure that out and then let's work through it. But we can definitely change the narrative from a negative narrative to a positive narrative. And I can tell you all that this might sound cheesy, and this might sound like, yeah, April, whatever, like that doesn't make that big of a difference, right? Honestly, that we're talking, but really what, how, what difference is it going to make if I say some negative things at work and I don't reframe them? Does that, does it really matter? It does matter. I can tell you that I've changed the tone and mood of two library branches as the manager um, I went into places, I went into the Blueford Library and the staff told me that they're just a little library in the hood that doesn't check out very many books. I said, wow, that's what you guys think? That's what you think is happening here? You guys are second in this library system for computer and meeting room usage. You're serving 900 people a day. You don't even know what you're doing here. You have no idea how important you are and the important work that you do. And when I had done that for, at the Blueford Library, I only had eight staff. It took me about six months to start seeing the difference, seeing the difference in the way the staff um, carried themselves into work, seeing the difference in staff absences, seeing the difference in patron behavior. They were measurable things that I could say to the staff, you know, wow, you guys, we had 15 less incidents last month because you're more positive, because you're carrying yourself in a more confident way, because you know what you're doing here every day. Plaza Library had 30 staff members. And when I started as the director there, um, they would not loan pins to patrons because the previous manager had told them that pins were expensive and we should not do that. I went to Office Depot. I bought four giant boxes of pins. I said, give a pin to anybody who wants one. We don't do that anymore. Even that one change led to better customer service. All of the things started happening from that one positive thing, right? It's, it triggers. Plaza staff was about 30 people. It took me about two years. And after two years of this, all the time, this, um, not all the time, because I'm a real person too. And some days I have bad days, but most of the time this. And two years later, it's a whole different place to work. It's a positive place where we share ideas and we serve our customers and meet their needs. And we're you know, happier to be there and we're doing projects and we're, it's fun, right? This does work. This does not work overnight. The Plaza Library was a big ship. It took a lot of time to turn, 
But if you do this consistently, you will see positive results. If you're not the person at the top that can just change everything, I was a person coming at the top. I, you know, I set the tone there. I really did. Talk to your managers, talk to them in positive ways, encourage them, encourage down, encourage up. It works all the ways. And once everybody gets on that page, it works so much better. So try to win one person over today and that'll make a difference. And then maybe try to win over another one. Maybe save the trickiest one till the end because you know that one's going to be a little harder, but it really does affect even the tricky one at the bottom that you think that person is never going to be a positive person. Maybe they're not because some people aren't, but when they see, oh, wow, this guy calls in sick less and that makes my job easier, I'm happy to know, right? <laughs> so it affects a lot of things that affect a lot of things. We're all one big machine with lots of cogs, right? But we can do this, changing the narrative. And finally, you guys, the last thing I want to talk about is taking care of yourself. The best thing you can do for your staff and for your coworkers is take care of yourself. They need you. They see your example. You're their model. Often, no matter what level you are, people are paying attention to what you're doing. They're paying attention to your work and your behavior. And you can be a positive model, positive role model, or a negative one. That's on you. Um, but if you're not taking care of yourself, you're certainly not going to be a positive model for anyone else. And if you're not showing that you are vulnerable, nobody else is going to show you that they are vulnerable. And right now, y'all, we are all vulnerable. Even the person that's acting like a rock is going through the collective trauma of pandemic. Even the person that seems to have no problems at all, they're going through this too. Everyone is affected, even if they pretend they're not. They might not want to admit it, and that's okay. People can admit or not admit what they want. People are going to be who they are, and that's fine, and we accept them where they are and for who they are. Um, but you still have to be taking care of yourself. So let's talk some about that. And self-care looks different for everyone, um, and it's going to take more than a pedicure, right? <laughs> oh, use a face mask. You'll be fine. <laughs> Will I? <laughs> I'm not sure that $1.50 uh, CVS face mask is going to solve all my problems, but it is nice to, to take a moment, you know, to face mask, whatever. Um, these are the things we're going through. You guys alluded to a lot of these things when I asked you how you were when we started this workshop, right? We had decision fatigue. If I have to make another decision, I'm going to scream and lose my gourd um, because we're constantly making decisions right now, right? Things are constantly changing. We're constantly having to decide what to do what's best in this situation that I don't even know about or know what's going to happen. Um, decision fatigue is real. Trauma is real. The collective trauma of pandemic on top of just the regular trauma that can be life sometimes. Right. And then you add to that being in a service industry and serving the public, the secondary trauma that happens at our jobs, um, other people's trauma that we take on, um, your coworkers whose family members have COVID and this and that and that, and you listen and you love and you care, but that is secondary trauma that you're taking on. I didn't experience that horrible thing, which is good. And I'm sorry, someone else had to secondary trauma. We're exhausted. We're tired. Sometimes we don't have enough time to do all the things that we want to do. Sometimes we have too much time because, you know, we're quarantined or stuck or can't do the things we want to do. And it just all feels like too much. We have all experienced great loss. We've experienced great loss of life as a country. We've experienced personal losses through the pandemic, not being able to celebrate our birthdays, Christmas with our family, all of the travel that we missed, all of the things. We've all experienced a great loss. Um, all of this is happening to us and to others. So we're worried. <laughs> we don't know what's going to happen. All the bad, right? Ah, it's a lot to deal with. But once we've acknowledged it, we can start dealing with it better, right? I'm not saying any of this to trigger anyone. If anyone is having extra feels, please take time to take care of yourself. Um, if you need to excuse yourself, do so um, anytime. When we're experiencing all of these things at once, it can make everything a little more difficult. It can make something that might not have triggered you or been a problem for you in any way in the past, a problem right now. 
like in the past, I did not have anxiety that I felt was too hard to handle. I worried about things sometimes, but it was not nearly the level of anxiety that I get right now, right? And I have to acknowledge that. And I have to say, because of all of these things, I'm experiencing extra and I need to be able to acknowledge that and take care of that, right? Take care of yourselves, darlings, you've got to. So here's what we want to avoid. Before I talk about the things that we're going to do, I want to talk about the things that we're not going to do, right? Um, we are going to avoid basing our self-worth on our productivity. This for me was key. I never thought about this concept ever in my life until my work got taken away from me because of COVID. A very smart person that I love very much, Brandy Sanchez, who uh, formerly from the Daniel Boone Regional Library in Columbia, Missouri, uh, did a workshop for the Missouri Library Association. And she said the words, your self-worth is not based on your productivity. You have self-worth just because you're a person. And I started sobbing, y'all. I started sobbing. I lost it. I never even considered that. I've always based my self-worth on what I'm producing, how well I'm doing at work, if I'm a good parent, all of the things. Never just like, I'm worthy. Oh my gosh. If I didn't do anything, I'm still worthy. If I stayed in bed this entire day, I'm still worthy. I never thought about it, you guys. And at that moment, I was open to that message and it struck me to my core. So I want you guys to all know you are worthy. You're 100% worthy for no other reason than you are a person, a worthy, wonderful, special person, right? So don't base your self-worth on anything but you, okay? I want you all to avoid acting like you aren't having a hard time too. It's hard. It's hard for me. It's hard for you. It's hard. By showing that you are vulnerable, other people will be able to show you that they too are vulnerable. If you are never vulnerable, people will never be vulnerable around you. When I had to tell my staff that I was taking part-time leave and I wasn't going to be there full-time to support them during a pandemic, I put my head in my hands and I cried. Y'all, it was hard. And I don't cry at work ever. I've cried at work three times. I can tell you all of the three times that I've cried at work before the pandemic. Now, you might find me sitting at my desk weeping more often, and that's okay. Things strike me different now. I've lost some of my hard edge and that's okay. It makes me more of a person, a real person that people can talk to and that people can relate to. You wanna be relatable. I want you all to avoid taking on all the work. If someone else can't do it, that doesn't mean you're the one that should. You don't have the capacity either. If you do have the capacity, great, take on the work. If you don't have the capacity, don't. Don't take on all the work. You're not doing yourself any favors. You're going to burn out, and then you're not going to be doing anyone any favors. Protect your capacity. Protect it. Protect it like a thing you love. Don't be fake about how you feel. Keep it real. That goes back to acting like you weren't having a hard time, too. I want you guys to make sure you're venting to the appropriate people. This one is tricky. We all need to vent sometimes, you guys. I talk about positive language and positive narratives and all of these things in the workplace, and it is important. But there are also times you just need to vent. You need to say, patron X was a giant blankety blank today, and I have had enough. You need to vent. That's, that's part of life. Vent to your friends, vent to your family, vent to your cat, vent to your plant, vent to something that's appropriate. Venting is not something that should always happen to your coworkers. Sometimes it should. Sometimes your coworkers can be your friends, but you need to make sure that you're venting to the appropriate people. Avoid venting to inappropriate people. And I don't want to say it out loud, but I'm going to anyway. You have to be very careful who you trust. 
we want to trust our coworkers and we want to be friends with the people that we work with. But if you vent to the inappropriate person, that information can spread and it can just tank a positive workplace so quickly. So make sure that you're venting to the appropriate people. And I want you also to avoid thinking that you are invincible. No one is invincible. Okay. So let's talk about the things that we should be doing every day. We've talked about all the things we shouldn't. Um, so let's talk about the things we should. I want to encourage you all to show grace for yourself and for others. Um, Self-grace, self-compassion. Um, acknowledging your self-worth, all of those things are really important. And we also need to accept that about other people. Other people are also great. Other people deserve forgiveness. Other people are also worthy just because they're people. We need to accept them for where they are and expect to be accepted for where we are and accept ourselves for where we are. That doesn't mean that we don't want to improve or get better because we always do. Um, but we're also fine with ourselves right now. Show ourselves some grace. We need to assume the best about ourselves and others. I have an example for this one. Um, I work with a guy, he's a great guy. He does our web stuff and he really is an amazing person. Um, and I really dig him, his name's Dave. He said in a meeting, I took it very personally and was very offended. He said something along the lines of, um, us single people with no kids are picking up the slack. And I heard all these people that have taken off to take care of their kids are slacking. That's not what Dave meant. It's not what he meant at all. But my immediate reaction to his statement was, forget you, Dave. I'm struggling here. Taking care of this 12-year-old sucks. I hate online school. Sixth grade can kiss my grits. I'm done. Just because you're single doesn't mean that you have it easier. I would love to be at work doing all the things that you're doing. And I just can't be right now. <laughs> and I, I mean, inside, I was just like screaming, like Dave has no compassion for me. Dave is so cold. Dave's awful. Can't stand Dave. I love Dave. <laughs> when I had a minute to reflect on that, I should not have assumed that Dave meant any of those negative things because of course he didn't. Dave's going through his own stuff which leads right to the next one. Be empathetic to yourself and others. Dave was at work 40 hours a week while other people were working at home. Dave was doing it. Dave was working really hard. He wasn't saying anything negative about me and why his comment might have been maybe not the best thing to say in the exact way that he said it. Dave's gone through some stuff too. And I had to be empathetic and I had to assume the best about him. He didn't mean anything personal against me ever. Dave would never say anything bad about me and I wouldn't say anything bad about him. It was just, you know, something that happened. I assumed the best about him. I'm empathetic towards what he's doing. We moved on. It was never even an issue, right? So we need to make sure that we know and say our limits. Um, that goes right back to advocating for our capacity only doing what we can do, not taking on more than we can. You will burn out. You will not be taking good care of yourself. And you, in the end, will not do the things as well as you should or could. And most of all, you just have to love yourself, which is easier said than done, I know. But we can do it. <laughs> Put yourself right up there in your top priority category and make sure that you're loving yourself. Okay. Building self-compassion is the best way to learn to be more empathetic for others. If you don't understand yourself, how will you understand other people? Work on your self-compassion, your grace towards yourself, appreciating your self-worth and taking care of yourself. That will reflect in the things that you do, and it will reflect with the people that you work with and around. Okay. So who has time? I'm about to run out of time. So this is my last slide, I think. I've got only a couple more. Um, who has time for self-care, right? Who has time? I don't have time for anything but that 10 minute face mask, right? Because I'm doing so much other stuff and I have to take care of everyone else and all the things. So I'm gonna say again, your worth is not measured by your productivity. 
If you need more time to take care of yourself, find something that isn't that important and take it off your list. If you can't take anything off your list, figure out ways maybe to work smarter, figure out ways to ask for help, um, figure out a way to phone a friend and at least be able to, to say how you feel um, about that situation. I understand that sometimes you just can't take things off your list. I get that. Uh, make sure that you're not comparing yourself to others. Envy the green-eyed monster. Don't let that come out. You yourself are worthy in your way. They are worthy in their way. Don't compare yourself. You're different people. Make sure you're letting yourself rest, getting good sleep, going to bed on time, doing all of those things. That's how we refresh. Um, this one is really important to me. Give yourself permission to feel your feels. We're big on feeling our feelings in my family. Um, some people might say we're a little overdramatic, but I think they're wrong. We just give our space, ourselves space to feel our feelings. If you need to cry, cry. If you need to be mad, be mad. Feel your feelings, acknowledge them, give yourself space to feel them, and then move on. I would like to encourage you all to educate yourself on the grief cycle. Um, know that the grief cycle is not linear. Anything on the grief cycle can happen anytime and for any amount of time, but knowing about the grief cycle can be helpful. We've all experienced great loss. Loss causes grief. So we're all experiencing some sort of grief right now. And if you can say, oh, thinking about the grief cycle right now, maybe this is where this person's at. This is how I'm going to give them space. Or maybe this is where I'm at. And this is how I'm going to give myself space. And I would encourage you all to be mindful, even if you just have a minute or two, stop, center yourself, think about how you feel, think about what might help how you feel. In this minute right now, do I need to step outside and take a deep breath? In this minute right now, do I feel calm? In this minute right now, am I angry about something? Um, take a minute or two to be mindful, to center. Um, how does my body feel right now? Am I thirsty? Am I hungry? When was the last time I had a drink of water? Um, all of those things, those little things that even if it's just a minute or two, be mindful of yourself. Okay. Here is my name, my number, my email, um, a couple of my favorite books that have informed some of the work that I do. All of these things are being recorded. So this is available to any of you. Um, if you want to snap a picture with your phone, anything at all. If I can help, if I can help provide advice, if I can be a sounding board, anything at all, um, please don't hesitate to be in touch with me. I'm really happy to, to talk to you, um, to try to help, to try to share resources, anything at all that I can do. And we have, it looks like maybe five minutes, seven minutes-ish left. Um, I did want to leave some time for question and answer, if there's anything that I can talk about more, anything that might have been confusing, um, please feel free to, to type questions in the chat box or unmute yourself and, and ask. Thank you all so much for listening, for your attention today. I really do appreciate it.